All righty. Good afternoon, good morning, or good night, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, great to have you here. Um, today, we will have a basic webinar about Transcribus, walk you through uh, the most important concepts in Transcribus, and yeah, get you started with Transcribus. Um, what's the content of, of this webinar? Um, first, I will give you a short introduction about Transcribus, um, and then we will have a closer look at a uh, more standard workflow for Transcribus and an advanced workflow for Transcribus. And finally, we will also have some time for a QA. and a Have a look at the questions that you've already raised during registration. There were quite a, a few. We've tried to group them together in categories. And then we will also, of course, answer the questions you might have during this webinar. You can just enter them in the chat and then we will try to answer as many as possible. But first, um, let me just quickly introduce you to the team who is today with me here. Um, first, we have Sarah from our user success team. Then we have Helene from our comms team. And finally, it's me, I'm Flo. I'm a member of the board of directors here at Transcribus and also um, yeah, employed with uh, the product development. Now, let's have a look at what Transcribus is in first place. You all know this probably, and that's probably why we all are here attack of old documents, but how do we get that information out? And that's where we here from Transcribus come into play. That's what we are building software for. And that's what we are trying to solve with Transcribus. So first getting the information and then getting the text out of that material. And finally also being able to get any information out into other formats like uh, PDF.x or more advanced formats like XML formats. So to make it short, Transcribus is an AI-powered LA. So we are trying to build a software where um, we are providing a tool that helps you um, working and reducing the yeah, time-consuming uh, and laborious work with historical documents because the real fun is actually working with the documents and not transcribing it. And that's where Transcribus can come into play and help you um, yeah, reducing a lot of uh, work and then really focus on the more fun things. So analyzing the content, understanding what's actually uh, in that material and on a mar much larger scale that has been uh, yeah, possible before, as you can now recognize thousands of pages with the click of a button um, to fully uh, exploit the potential of what AI and also software can do for you. Let me go to the next page. Um, for that, we have tried to think of um, yeah, how are you going to use Transcribus mainly? So to have a standard workflow of working with documents in Transcribus, first place you need to get the data in. So uploading the documents, we will have a look at how you can upload documents in Transcribus. Next, um, where the magic uh, will come into play, how you can recognize text with the help of AI within Transcribus. Then you, we also have a quite powerful text and layout editor where you can edit the text and also the layout of your documents. And eventually, um, you also want to share your uh, document, export your documents, and yeah, do the fun stuff with it. And we also have a more advanced workflow. There's one step that you can add here in Transcribus, which is mainly training. You can train your own custom AI models. So you can train the AI to exactly fit your material um, to recognize the text that you are working with. That's one of the strengths of Transcribus. Um, it has always been. We have about 25,000 models that have been trained in the last years within Transcribus. And thanks to that, very uh, yeah, interesting and very I mean, nice projects uh, could be completed and also um, basically unlocked a lot of yeah, very valuable information. Yeah, so now let's begin with uploading and managing documents. I will hand over to my colleague, Helene, who will tell you more about that. Exactly. Uh, thanks everyone for joining this webinar again and welcome also from, from me. So the first step in our standard and basic workflow is always if you have material, you want to work with it and you want to work with it on Transcribus. So how do you get it in Transcribus? How do you get it on the platform? Um, to understand that, let's first understand how we manage the documents. So once they are uploaded, where can you even find them? So in Transcribus, there are collections. And these are folders in which the documents are stored. So a collection is usually a project. 
here, for example, a beginner's webinar, which is a project for us. So this is the folder in which we have the documents for this, let's call it project. Um, the collections also have a name and an ID. And in the collections, you can have as many documents as you like. So there's no limit to the documents that you want to upload in it. In the documents, there you find the pages or the images of the pages of each document. And so a document can contain, for example, just one page if it's a letter. Um, if it's a book, it can contain up to hundreds of pages. So it's important to understand this structure and how the pages and documents and projects are organized. This way you can also structure your work in Transclose more effectively. Um, and then I think we can already take a look uh, at how that looks in the app. And we will show you how you can upload your documents and how that will look like in the app. So this is the landing page after you have logged in with your account. This is what you see. You're in the desk workspace. Um, and I mean, in the workspace, this is where literally the work happens. So here you have access to your collections, to your documents. Um, and this is also where you can open them and edit them. But let's first uh, look at how you can upload them. So we can see we have the collections tab. When you open it, you can see on the right, on the right side that you can add a new collection. So if you want to add uh, a new project, you're just starting out, you can click on new collection and then give your collection a name. So this is then my new project that I'm working on. Click on create and immediately the collection is opened and you can already see that you have the button here to upload your documents. So simply click on it and then you can drag and drop your files or browse for them. And my colleague has some, some images already uh, prepared. So you can select them and they can also give your document a name. So now you know what documents these are. This is uh, the pages of a diary and click on submit. And this is how you're uploading the images of your documents to Transcribos. So depending on how many pages uh, you're uploading, it might take a little bit until they're all there. You can see in the jobs queue that the job for uploading them is running. And you can see below it of all the finished jobs. So uh, quite soon it should also be a, a finished job and you could see all the images. Um, just usually helps if you just reload the tab. And uh, now you can see the new document in your collection, my new project. And once we open my diary, so the document, we see all the images of the pages. Um, we also have a few options to manage uh, the documents. So it is possible to um, set a status. So this is, for example, if it's a new document, um, you can also exactly so if it's the transcription is in progress, it's yellow. For now, it's gray because it's newly uploaded. Um, and we can look at that a little bit later. Let's go back to the documents and I can explain more about managing documents. In the document, you can move them. You can also copy them or delete them. And um, to move a document, you can select the collection where you want to move it to, select it, and then move documents. Something that now is it's gone. Now it's gone. Oh, no, no, no <laughs> we moved it to the other collection. Do, yeah, something that you can do. So it's not gone. Is create shortcuts. Um, maybe we can show that as well. So yeah. by creating shortcuts, you basically have a link in a different collection, but it will still stay in this main collection. So this is exactly um, so that this doesn't happen, that it's not just simply gone, but you can have it in your main, in your main document, in your main collection, and still access it from a different one as well. Exactly. So just to reiterate, we have two collections, basically. The new one that we created and the other one that we have prepared. We moved it from the new one to the other one that we have prepared. And now let's link the, link it back to the new collection and create a shortcut. Here I have already pre-selected it before because I did it before. And now I can click on Share. And if you know, go back here to my new project, you see here is the document and you can see 
put that little icon that is linked into that collection. Back to you, Helene. Yeah, thank you. Um, we can also delete documents if you don't want to work them uh, with them anymore and you feel like they're just hogging up space. You can delete them. But the good thing is, when you delete them, you see this little trash bin icon in the top right corner. And if you delete them either by accident or you a day later you think like, oh no, I still haven't finished working with them, you can still restore them for 14 days. So they're not completely gone for 14 days. You can simply restore them and then you can just keep working with them as if uh, the deleting process has never happened, basically. Yeah, I think this is um, the basic information on how you can upload your documents and how they are stored and organized in Transcribus. So again, just to quickly um, summarize, you have the collections. In the collections are your documents and in the documents are your pages. So now that we have our documents in Transcribus, how do I get the automatic transcription? How do I get the text out basically? And to do that, you use the Transcribus AI models. So to convert the printed or handwritten text into digital text, you're using the Transcribus AI models and you can use either public ones or custom AI models. So in that way, we have basically two approaches. The public models are pre-trained, so you can use them right away. Uh, we'll show you shortly how you can do that. Um, they're quite easy to use, and we have public models for handwritten material, for printed material, for different languages and scripts. Uh, and we have custom models as well. My colleague will talk about the custom models a bit later. So with the public models, we already have over 100, uh, 190 public models available. Again, for different scripts and languages. So for example, for German Courant or Ottoman Turkish, um, we have a lot of models available. And you can choose or you should choose the model that is most that most closely fits your material. So if you have, for example, a diary written in English from the 18th century, you can filter the language um, if it's handwritten or printed, and you can also filter for the centuries or the time period that it was written in. So according to your filter, um, you should be able to select a model that best fits your material. And then you can simply select it, click on it, and start the text recognition. If you click on the model itself, you'll also see further information about the model. Um, for example, on how many pages it was trained, so the training set size. And you can also see how accurate it is by looking at the character error rate. Um, that's the CER, and that gives you an idea of how accurate the model is. So everything under 10% is already a really, really uh, re quite reliable and quite accurate model. One of the newer technologies we have are supermodels. And what's quite impressive about them is that they are quite large and also very versatile models. So this means that you can use this one model for different scripts and different languages and even for mixed material. So I mentioned before that you can filter public models according to the material, according to the language. With the supermodels, you don't have to do that. You can just use one for different languages and for different scripts. And this is especially helpful when you work with mixed material. If it's a book that has some, some handwriting in it, um, in the margins, for example, that can be quite useful. Uh, one supermodel, for example, as you can see here, is a text titan. And this one has been trained on, uh, I think, six different languages. And uh, it gives basically the best out of the box experience. Um, I can just say for myself, I was really surprised when I first tried it out myself compared to the um, public models that we have. So I think we can now take a look at how we run the text recognition in the app. So let's open our document and we can see the pages. So what we do here is we select the pages that we want to have recognized. So simply tick this little box and then click on recognize. 
And now you see the page that you've seen as a screenshot before. So you can see on the left side, uh, you have a favorite models, but you can also just click on the public models. And there you have the entire list of all public models available for you. And you can also filter or search um, depending on the type of material that we have. So we have an English diary. Let's look at what English models we have. Again, we have the text Titan because it's a supermodel um, and it also includes English. Um, but we also have uh, English Eagle, for example, that we could try out. So select the model and then click on start recognition. And with that, the job is started. So the job means basically that the task has started to automatically recognize your material, your pages with this AI model. Um, after you've started the text recognition, you can open your document again, or you can open your pages again, and then they should be recognized. This might take a while. Again, like similar with uploading the pages, depending on how many pages you uh, try to recognize at once, um, it, it could take a few minutes. Um, but I think we already have another document prepared, maybe where we can see, um, is it the Marjorie Fleming diary? That's yes, the exactly. The corrected ones, but That's... I think also here we have, yeah, we have some output of some exactly. recognition. So this is uh, what it will look like. So let's, I think we can go back to the um, slides for now. And I'll show you what we can do after we've let the technical text recognition run. So what happens when a page is recognized? When a page is recognized, there are two steps that are happening, which is first the layout recognition, so the lines and text regions, which basically looks at where the text is in the image. And then the second step is the text recognition. Now, after we have let the text, rec text recognition run, we can start the editing and searching progress process. So now that we've uploaded the documents and we have a transcript, we do want to know what, what was written in your document. So we want to know what's in the transcript. And to understand better how that works, let me quickly explain that in a little bit more detail. So as we run the text recognition, as mentioned before, there are two steps that are happening. The documents are segmented into uh, text regions and into lines and base lines. So that means that the text region is the box that encloses the text handwritten or printed text in the image. And then the baselines are the reference points for the text recognition. So this is a line that runs along the bottom of, uh, along the bottom of the text, as you can see here in the slide as well. And having these regions and these lines is important so that the text recognition model knows where the text is and where the lines are. And so it can recognize the text correctly. So, if we've before wondered what was in the text or what was written in our documents, we now know as the image has been transferred into um, computer readable text. You can see here um, the screenshot of what we already seen in the app uh, very shortly before. So on the left, you have your image and on the right, you have the text. So now you know what's written uh, in, in the material that you looked at. Um, now, it can happen, especially when using public models, that there are some mistakes, um, but you can easily correct them in the editor. So because the public models have been trained on a different material than the material that you just uploaded, and since handwriting can differ a lot depending on the person or the time period, some mistakes can happen. But as you can see here, you can correct them. And the great thing is in the editor, you can not only correct them, but you can also add information and enrich your transcription. So let's take a look again how that how that looks and how that works in the transcription. Let's see if app. the magic happened in the meantime. Let's see. Ah, yes. The orange <laughs> color says yes. Exactly. So that again showed the different status. So let's see. We have a transcript here, automatic transcription. And uh, there are definitely 
some uh, some mistakes that that uh, happen there, but we can easily correct them. So you can just simply click into the text editor on the right side, and as you can see, my colleague just simply corrected the words in the transcription. Um, sometimes it also happens that the in the when the transcription happens that lines are mixed around, so maybe the order of the lines is wrong, and you can simply fix that by clicking on the layout tree and selecting and then just dragging the line to the right place that it belongs to according to here, what you see. Here it was the correctly line. recognized, but just here for the purpose of showing exactly. we can switch around the, all of the lines. Exactly. Um, now, when it comes to enriching your documents, you can add tags. So how that works, or let me maybe explain first what tags are. So tags are used to identify and label specific textual or structural elements. So in the text, it means that I can identify, for example, a date or a place. And I add that by enabling the tag button on the right side. And then exactly like here, disable or enable tags, selecting the word that I want to add the tag, and then I can choose the tag that I want to add. I can do the same also for the layout. So if you have, uh, if you're working with a document, for example, there is a header or a footnote, you can select the region and then choose a tag, a structural tag to kind of indicate um, what type of structure this is. So the labeling is really useful to create a database of information and it can also help provide context. Example here with a paragraph, so you also have context in, um, uh, in your editor. You can also use transcribals to search the contents of your documents. So after you have transcribed your, your documents, let's say you have hundreds of pages and you're looking for a specific name and you want to look for that, you can use our uh, search. So you can search either documents, you can search collections and use global text search. Maybe we can um, try that out, how that looks like. So Let's we stick had... with Saturday. Let's stick we with all Saturday. think about the weekend, right? Uh, now it's not working yet, that's true, because there's some slight delay between the search being indexed and the text it's being recognized. So Saturday. Saturday is misspelled, that's why I can't find it. That can also be, let's see if we can fiddle that around with our fuzzy search. No, it's not in the index yet. So it, there's a slight delay between the document being recognized and saved and then also being searchable. But there Sorry, is um, you, there was an the R before the A mm. in the original. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's have a look. We have it here. Saturday. I think it's okay like that, right? Anyways, I think it's still not indexed because that might take a couple of minutes until it's then findable. Um, but what you could then still use is fuzzy search. So the fuzziness, so how many characters uh, it can be wrong in terms of searching. And as you switch it up to high, usually if there's one character that is uh, spelled incorrectly, you would still find it. But yeah, as it's not indexed, that might yeah take like five, 10 minutes until it's indexed, um, then we would find it. Let's maybe try it out at the end of this meeting and it would work. Um, yeah, we try also to work on a solution to make that a little bit faster, but usually uh, you don't really search like uh, two minutes after you have recognized it might be the case. Um, but as you're usually working with larger amounts of, of text, then um, it's still fine if you wait five minutes until it's searchable. To quickly go back, did you want to add anything, Elena? Um, no, I think um, these were the steps that I wanted to explain. So we looked at um, how to upload your documents, where you can find your documents and starting the transcription. And I think uh, Sarah will now take over and explain how you can uh, share and export your material. And we'll go into further detail um, into the uh, training 
text recognition models. Exactly. And at the yes, end, as is... said, we have time for. Sorry, Sarah, Just... we have some time for questions. Then we can also address those questions in the Q and A at the end. Yeah, one, one user wants to see how to um, correct a baseline. Now, maybe we have a document open here so we can show how to correct a baseline. Now. Uh, we have a good example here because here the baseline recognition did not work perfectly. So there's two options. Um, there were two lines recognized here. You can see this one and this one. So basically what you could do here is either opt for having both or just delete one by hitting delete and then extend this one by just drawing or dragging this point to where the line actually start, uh, yeah, starts. And then you can just save that's also maybe important to mention. All saves are saved as a new version. So you can always see what happened. If you want to jump back, you can basically just say, I want to edit. Yeah, first you can click on it and you see, hey, this version looked different here. The baselines were different. You can always say, hey, I want to edit this version. And then basically you're back at this version, you can edit this version and then continue work with, uh, yeah, the older version if you kind of have made some mistakes or want to change something and if we jump back to the newest version you can see here's the corrected baseline and also the tag that i've assigned before or is there anything else you want to add Sarah? no thank you very much okay so now we slides. can move to the uh, to sharing and exporting your document so helena show us how to uh, run the automatic recognition, uh, but what we can do with uh, the data, you can search uh, your documents uh, within Transcribus, uh, but uh, you can always uh, uh, export uh, your uh, documents uh, and then work uh, with them uh, in the format uh, that uh, you prefer, or you can publish them. Uh, uh, and one of the options that you have to publish uh, is uh, Transcribus sites, uh, uh, and we will show it later. So to export your document, it's very easy. You have just to select the documents or the pages that you want to export. Then there are these three dots. You click on them and you select export. After that, you have you can choose different options. You can download the images. You can export your transcriptions as a Word document. You can have uh, a PDF, a simple TXT file, or uh, you can uh, uh, also export uh, the page XML, which is a uh, uh, XML schema that gives you both the text information and the layout information. So you will have uh, um, not only the text, but also all the information about the text regions, uh, the lines, uh, the baselines, and the coordinates. Uh, these are the basics the basic export functions. Uh, and uh, if you click uh, on standard export, export, you can also access some advanced export uh, features. These are available if you are in the paid plan, the scholar plan, or if you are a member. And then later Flo will explain us what does it mean to be in a scholar plan. And if you have uh, the uh, scholar plan, uh, you have access to advanced features. For example, in the PDF, uh, uh, you can export a PDF uh, and have uh, the dev default PDF uh, is an image uh, plus uh, the text uh, layer underneath the image. Uh, but uh, with the advanced function, you can also decide if you want to have the text uh, as uh, an additional page. And then we have uh, the uh, Word option. Uh, you can decide how you want to export uh, your uh, uh, tags. Uh, for example, if you have tagged uh, uh, the abbreviations, uh, here you can decide uh, if you want uh, to keep them um, in your Word document uh, or uh, if you want to exp uh, have uh, a document uh, with the expanded abbreviation or if you want to substitute uh, the abbreviation with the expansion. So there are a lot of options uh, here. And then uh, with the export option, you can also um, there is also the Alto um, XML and uh, the TI XML, the TI exporter, which is very useful if you are working in digital humanities and you want to create a digital edition of your documents. And then another interesting 
option is uh, the spreadsheet. This uh, is uh, uh, helpful if you have tables uh, on uh, your uh, in your documents because because in the, with this export you can export uh, your data in a tabular format uh, or you can also export uh, all your tags. Uh, so if you have tagged uh, your documents, for instance, if you have tagged uh, all the um, places mentioned in the document uh, with this type of export, you can have a spreadsheet uh, with all uh, the tagged uh, places, uh, the original uh, tag word, uh, and then the tag uh, and all the properties associated with this tag. And when you click uh, Start uh, Export, uh, you will receive uh, uh, an email uh, with a link uh, and you can uh, exp um, download uh, the um, the document uh, from the link uh, or also here in the server in the jobs uh, page uh, you can also download from here uh, your document and yes. yeah here exactly and this is uh, the option uh, if you want uh, to work uh, with your documents uh, outside of transcribus but if you want to publish them uh, uh, we have a very nice option uh, that called called transcribus sites uh, with this option you can uh, create a, a website uh, and publish uh, your pages uh, directly from transcribus so you don't need to download uh, the images uh, and the uh, and the document and the transcription and upload them to another content management system or to another website. But you can, uh, with a few click, uh, um, make uh, your documents and your transcriptions uh, public. And you can see here various public uh, website uh, transcript sites. So this is quite big because it's from an archive, but you can also create a, 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 a small transcript site with a, a, a thousand pages. Uh, and what is nice uh, here is that uh, uh, there is a very um, nice uh, um, searching option. So as a uh, flow show as uh, you can uh, browse your documents and search uh, for terms uh, like uh, for Zurich, uh, and then uh, you will get all the pages where Zurich is mentioned. Uh, and then the results are also highlighted uh, both on the image and both the uh, both on the image and the the page the transcription. And also, as you can see, the view is uh, very nice, uh, especially for the people who are who is are going to consult uh, these documents, uh, because there is this uh, uh, correspondence uh, between uh, the image uh, and the transcription, and uh, you, they can always jump uh, to the correct uh, line of the page, uh, and uh, the, the 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 image moves uh, with uh, the lines. Um, you can customize uh, your transcribus site, so you can decide the name, uh, upload your document, uh, upload the images that you want, uh, the colors, uh, and then you have uh, some pages uh, where you can write, uh, where you can uh, explain your project uh, and uh, add the credits uh, to work on it uh, and so on. And what is also interesting is that if you spot an error, you can always go back uh, to your transcribus collection, uh, correct the error, and uh, the correction will show up in a few minutes in transcribal side. So it's very easy to um, edit and correct uh, the documents uh, and you can uh, publish them uh, if, even if you haven't corrected everything. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, people can access uh, the documents. Go back to the presentation. Yes, Maybe to exactly. Kind of quickly tackle one direct question regarding uh, copyright concerns. Uh, as the websites are built by the project and the copyright um, yeah, needs to be cleared with the project. So um, we uh, yeah, try to make sure that we also um, evaluate if the copyright is given or not um, with those concerns. But basically it's like setting up your own website. Um, you need to make sure that you have the copyright um, of the material that you're sharing, obviously. With many historical materials, especially with older ones, copyright is not that much of an issue. Sometimes it certainly is, but yeah, especially with public domain images and yeah, larger collections from earlier times, it's not yeah that much of an issue. Uh, yeah, as said, sometimes. Okay, now we will talk about uh, training. 
your own uh, models. Uh, so first, uh, we have seen how to use uh, a public model. So a model trained by other users or by the Transcubus community, but not always uh, there is a public model that works uh, as you want on your documents. Uh, so it's also possible to train a custom model. So models uh, that uh, you train specifically on your documents on the writings uh, present in your documents. Uh, and uh, the pros of this uh, option of, of training custom models is that uh, you can uh, you can get uh, a higher accuracy uh, and then you can control uh, the data that goes into the model. So you can decide uh, how to transcribe uh, certain terms, uh, how to transcribe abbreviations, how to deal with uh, um, capital letters, punctuation, and so on. So you have much more freedom in deciding the, how the output will look like because the model will train based on the examples that you show to him and then you can fine tune it to your project and your needs. To do that, the cons is that you need to spend a bit of time to train your model and we will see now how to do it. Um, yeah, here you see uh, this uh, English uh, um, hand uh, is not very uh, very clear, and uh, we tested uh, the English eagle on this hand, uh, and the results aren't uh, so so good. They are accepted acceptable, but if you want to have a more accurate transcription, uh, the the option that you have uh, is uh, to train uh, a text recognition uh, models tailor on these documents. Um, we have talked about uh, the, the mo models, uh, but what are uh, AI model? Uh, AI, model uh, an, uh, AI model is uh, an algorithm. And uh, when uh, you train uh, your own model, uh, you show to the machine uh, specific examples uh, to help uh, the artificial intelligence to recognize uh, a, and understand uh, the writing uh, in your training data. So you create some uh, uh, transcriptions, uh, some, uh, some sample pages. Uh, you feed uh, the machine uh, with these examples. Um, there are both, there are images with the accurate transcription. Uh, the machine learns uh, on them, uh, and then the machine uh, becomes able to uh, do the same uh, on new pages not seen during the training. Uh, there are different types of AI models that you can train uh, within Transcribus, uh, the text recognition models uh, to transcribe your documents. Then we have uh, the baseline models uh, to recognize uh, the baselines uh, and the fields and table models to find the text region. Today, we will focus uh, on uh, the text recognition models because it's a beginner webinar and uh, uh, most of you are here to learn uh, how to train uh, a text model. Uh, the first thing that uh, uh, you need is uh, these examples uh, that you have to use to, uh, train, to train the model. The training data uh, it's called ground truth in machine learning and also in transcribus uh, and uh, is the accurately transcribed text uh, paired with its image. So when we created the ground truth to train a model, uh, we need to transcribe uh, some pages uh, and make sure that the correspondence uh, between the line in the image uh, and the line of text uh, is correct. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, often you don't need uh, to transcribe uh, everything from scratch, uh, but our suggestion is to uh, start uh, the recognition with a public model. Uh, so do a first uh, recognition with the, this model. Uh, in this way, you will have uh, all the baselines uh, and also a rough uh, text. Uh, then you can correct uh, your text, uh, save it as ground truth, uh, and then uh, start uh, the training. Uh, to have a first version of your model, 20, 25 pages of ground truth are a good start, but then it's always possible to train a multiple version of a model and refine your model more and more. So when you have trained the first version on 25 pages, then you can 
apply this model on new pages. Again, um, correct the transcriptions, save them as ground truth, and uh, train a second version of your model. In this way, you will uh, reduce the time uh, transcribing your documents because you apply uh, better and better models. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you can uh, uh, mm, you can increase uh, the number of uh, of grant pages, uh, and if you apply a, a a better version of your model, uh, you, you the models gets uh, you get better transcription, and uh, you reduce the time to create your grant return. Uh, in general, to have uh, a good model for a simple handwriting, uh, we recommend uh, 50 pages of ground root. Here uh, you have uh, some estimates based on our experience uh, on how much training data is uh, required. If we are working with printed text, uh, 25 pages of training data are enough and you can get a character error rate between 0.5 and 2%. Carter, the Carter error rate measures uh, the uh, the error in the transcription. So, uh, doing at the end of the training, uh, uh, some pages uh, are left are left aside during the training and used by the model to test its accuracy. And uh, the Carter error rate is measured on these pages uh, called uh, uh, validation set validation data. Um, this measures uh, compares uh, the ground root, so your perfect transcription and the automatic transcription, and you get uh, the character error rate, so the number of characters uh, transcribed incorrectly by the model. Uh, um, for printed text, uh, you can get a very low character error rate, uh, and uh, in, based on our experience, uh, usually uh, all, you training uh, a model uh, like the ones in Transcribus uh, get you better result uh, than using uh, a OCR, uh, uh, another OCR tool. Uh, if you are talking about uh, handwritten text, uh, if you have just one sim single hand uh, in your documents, uh, you would need uh, around 50 pages of ground root uh, and you can reach a character rate between two and 4%. Uh, and then you can, but you can also train uh, models uh, on uh, more than one hand or multiple hands, uh, if they are all seen in the training, uh, you need uh, more than 150 pages uh, and the cart error rate will be between four and 6%. And then there are, you can also create very big models. Uh, the effort is much more, but you can create them. Uh, and uh, so you can combine uh, many hands uh, from the same region and period. Uh, and when you have around 500 pages of ground root, you can train your model and you will, the, the current error rate will be a bit higher because these general models are also able to, to, to recognize uh, hands are not seen uh, in the training. Okay. Can we jump out? Then we can directly show the yes. next things directly in the mm -hmm. software. We have also documented um, them nicely. Let's just go back to the software. Yes, we can go to the tough stuff page. Okay, here you see um, on page uh, four, for instance, or two. Uh, here we have uh, our uh, automatic transcription and what we have to do uh, is uh, manually correct uh, the, the text. And uh, make sure that uh, the baselines uh, are correct, uh, and then uh, the text uh, uh, correspond to what is written uh, uh, in the document. So here, for instance, uh, we have to correct some capital letters, uh, uh, maybe some some names, uh, some dates. Uh, but the public model is already quite good here. When everything is correct, uh, you can uh, save your document as a run through. Uh, so you can change the status uh, here and uh, click uh, save. Um, when you have done this for around 25 pages, uh, you can uh, start the training. So we can go back uh, to the, um, yeah, to you the can other document. You see it yes. here at the color as well. So the status that you've set, 
Mm -hmm. Let's go to the larger one where we yeah. have more documents here. prepared. Yeah, here you can manually select uh, the pages uh, or you can also filter by status uh, if you want to filter just the final and the grant route pages. Uh, and then uh, you can select uh, all of them. Okay, we have uh, 159 pages, uh, which is a good number to train a model. And we click on train model. And here we want to train a text recognition model, so which is the first option. And automatically, all the selected pages are assigned to the training data. Um, the training data uh, comprises the pages uh, on which the model will learn. Uh, so all our grant root pages. Uh, around 10% uh, uh, of these pages uh, uh, is assigned to the validation data. So these pages are not used to train the model, but they are set aside uh, and used to attest the accuracy model uh, and uh, to um, calculate the carta error rate. Uh, you can decide uh, how many pages you want to assign uh, to the validation data. Our recommendation is to assign to the validation data 10% of your pages uh, uh, and uh, automatically select uh, them. So we can go on. And then the next step. Uh, you know, maybe just to add, usually I would advise to use those 10%. Don't save with the validation data. So that's basically where your model is evaluated and against. If you evaluate it against only a small set, then it's evaluated. Um, yeah, the test is yeah, pretty small. Um, and for that, especially depending on the amount of pages, if you really train a model with thousands of pages, then a validation set also of two of, or 5% might be sufficient. But usually with 100, 150, 10% is still a, a yeah, good number. If you go above 300, maybe then you can go start, start going on down to 5%. Um, otherwise, um, you train it basically. So basically, those text pages that the model uses to understand, am I doing good or am I doing bad? Um, they are important because that's basically where the model compares the results during training. Because what happens is during training, the model recognizes those 16 pages all over again. That's a result and compares it with the perfect result that we provide. And then the model can only understand Am I doing good or bad? And there, the characters are measured. So how many characters out of all characters in those 16 pages are recognized incorrectly? That's the character error rate. So if we say we have 10,000 characters in those 16 pages, which is not the case, but just putting in the number. And yeah, or let's say 100. We have 100 characters and five characters are recognized incorrectly, even if it's a yeah, capital A and it's corrected as a, as a I don't know, capital B, um, that's a that's an error. And then um, the model will have a character error rate of 5% if five characters out of 100 are recognized incorrectly. That's why saving at the validation set is um, yeah, not um, suggested. You should go with those 10% and then try to uh, reiterate with them. That's why also the validation sets should be chosen representatively. Um, just to add that, but sorry for interrupting, Sarah. No, no problem. And then here you can add uh, the uh, details uh, about your model, like the model name, uh, a short description that is usually helpful for yourself uh, to remember what uh, you put in the model, uh, when the model was trained, uh, and uh, yeah, different hands uh, or, or other details about the models. You can also add uh, a image uh, URL uh, to have a will improve that. Preview. I just need yeah. to add that because that's quite cumbersome at the moment. You can then just select one of the images um, because that will be displayed here at the moment. It's just an URL that you can put in, mm -hmm. um, but that will be improved soon. And then we have also the advanced settings. Uh, and the most important one uh, is the possibility to select uh, uh, a base model. No, we are training a baseline model. I think we did uh, oh, an yeah. error. Yeah. Uh, have I clicked on that? Yeah, maybe it's my <laughs> Let, Let's go back. Have I clicked on baseline? Yeah, the, the, the interface is the same. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. here we are. Uh, here you have, you have also had to add the language and the centuries. And here you can add a, a baseline, a base model. 
It means uh, when you add the base model, it means that uh, the training doesn't start from scratch, but from what uh, the previous model, have, the base model have already learned. It's useful, uh, especially if you see that uh, there is an, a, already a public model that works quite good on your documents, you can select it as a base model and usually a base model improves uh, the quality of uh, your, your model. You need just to make sure that uh, the base model was trained uh, on the same language and similar hands. So it doesn't make sense to select uh, a if, if you are training a, a model on uh, uh, 19th century English and writing, it doesn't make sense to use as a base model a, a model trained on medieval manuscripts. Uh, so there must need, we must have some similarities uh, between the documents uh, uh, used to train the base model and uh, your documents. So then um, there is the last page uh, that sums up everything, uh, and uh, then you can uh, start the training. Uh, uh, the training is done on our servers uh, and uh, in the job queue, you can always uh, look uh, at uh, the, the status of your training. Uh, so uh, you can look at the queue uh, and then uh, you will see when the training starts, uh, you will see that the status changes to in progress uh, and you will also receive an email when the training uh, is, uh, is finished. When the training is finished, you can go to models uh, and uh, you will see your model uh, here uh under in the dashboard and also or in the gallery and what okay. you have to look at uh, to evaluate the quality of your model uh, is uh and you can you can see it for another model is the carta okay. rate in this case is 4.30 percent this carta rate is measured on your uh, validation set and if you click on show description you can also see the learning curve um, uh, but yeah, what we also recommend is always to do some tests uh, because uh, the cartel rate is only a measure and uh, as Flo said, uh, it also counts uh, like uh, a space uh, or uh, a punctuation, different punctuation. Uh, so if, the, if you wrote a comma and uh, the automatic transcription uh, um, transcribed uh, a, a full stop, uh, it is counted as uh, one error as uh, another character. So it's always good uh, to do some tests on a few pages to really see how the model performs uh, and not just look at, not just look at the cart error rate and stick with it. Yeah, just having an eye on the time, we are yeah. running a little mm -hmm. bit late. So and we yeah, we have just... With uh, the other model. Three right. one slide uh, for the other models. Uh, you can see more information about them uh, in the help center. Um, the baseline models uh, can be trained to more accurately recognize a uh, text line in your material. So if you see that uh, the the default layout recognition doesn't work well, you can always train a baseline model and teach transcribers that you want to recognize uh, the lines uh, in a certain ways, uh, like uh, slanted lines, uh, very long or very short uh, lines. Uh. And then we have uh, the uh, fields uh, and uh, table models uh, to extract information for your documents. With field models, uh, you can train transcribers to automatically recognize uh, and mark certain layout components of the document. So instead of transcribing everything in this form, uh, you can teach transcribers where the place, uh, name, and year field are, uh, and train a field model to do that for you. So you don't have to manually um, draw the regions uh, and tag them uh, on every page. And then you can export uh, them uh, in a spreadsheet. So you will get uh, the, mm, the data in a structured way. And the same works for the tables. So you can train uh, um, Table, table models to automatically recognize the rows and columns. Uh, then when you have trained your model, you can apply it on your documents uh, and you get a fabulous structure. You run the recognition and in the end, you can export uh, the, the content of the document in a spreadsheet. Uh, so you, keep, you can keep uh, the tabular structure. Okay. Alrighty. Just in time to have a 
a quick wrap up and then we will have some more time for questions. We will, yeah, we will overrun a little bit um, considering that we will have some time for questions. Um, but first, uh, let's reiterate. We've tried to walk you through the most important steps. There are a lot more. So Transcribus is quite versatile. You can do a lot of different things with Transcribus. Um, yeah, we try to show you the most important ones. So getting uh, information in, so images in and text out, and then also information out from the text to uh, yeah unlock history. That is what our vision is. We want to provide the best tools for that. And Transcribus is uh, yeah our means and who is we? Uh, basically, yeah, behind Transcribus is a cooperative. So we are a cooperative based in Innsbruck in Austria. That's also one of the questions. Um, all our servers, so we are maintaining all of our infrastructure, infrastructure ourselves. All our, our servers are located in Innsbruck and in Austria, um, run by this cooperative. Um, it is basically a European cooperative and we have um, our own statutes where we try to, um, by the, by the yeah, law of our own statutes, invest everything that we um, yeah, earn in terms of being a company. So we also definitely need to make sure that we can maintain all of this and by the statutes, our shareholders are not allowed to get any dividends. So basically we are not doing any payouts. That's basically prohibited by our, our own standards. And we are investing everything into Transcribo. So running uh, this tool uh, or platform is the purpose of the read cooperative. So that's the cooperative behind Transcribo. And having uh, this possible uh, is a yeah, major undertaking that we are trying to achieve here. We are trying to provide those tools as a, yeah, uh, in a yeah, very cooperative way, as we really want to make sure um, that everybody that wants uh, access to historical documents um, has the tools. We are trying to, and here's a picture of our user conference. We are trying to do this in a very open way. So everybody can join the cooperative, can become a member and basically a co-owner of Transcribus, where you can also have your say as you have votes, or you can vote at the General Assembly. Um, and yeah, basically shape the future of Transcribus. Uh, All together, we have a very active community. We try to exchange as much as possible. Yeah, try to listen to the users as much as possible. Um, lately, we had to uh, work a little bit on technical depth, so there were not that many new features in the last months. Um, but finally, we have also just switched to a new uh, framework on our beta instance, and we'll yeah, shortly also release it on our productive version. Um, this means that we now can yeah, full steam ahead and continue um, integrating new tools and improving the existing tools because there are so many interesting projects happening. Um, yeah, and looking at this very uh, diverse bunch of people, uh, we really just this year in February had a had a great time learning about all of this. We had about 80 speakers on stage where um, all of them presented their work with Transcribus and shared what they are doing. Um, that's our way of doing things. We do it a little bit differently. Um, I said as a cooperative, kind of legally for profit, but as we have our own stat statutes, we try to uh, not be for profit. All we need to make sure is that we at least um, can maintain the status of Transcribus and further develop Transcribus. Um, yeah, and when then, um, doing this also obviously needs to uh, have an under uh, lying model. So we try to still have as much as possible for free with the individual plan. So every user gets 100 credits, which is basically 100 pages. They can recognize every single month for free. You can also train your models for free. That's also not limited. There are some features, of, as you've heard, heard some more advanced export features and um, the super models. So those features where the usage of Transcribus is probably more advanced, we've tried to um, put them into higher plans or higher tiers as the scholar plan, which we think is still a quite good value proposition considering that we really need to also um, build this tool and maintain this tool and also have our infrastructure that we're running. And then we also have more uh, yeah, advanced um, plans with the team plan that's yeah, mainly purposed for smaller teams that are working, especially research teams working together on unlocking historical sources and eventually we also have organization plans for organizations that are using Transcribus on larger scales. We we have organizations with hundreds of users that are using Transcribus in their daily uh, work and also um, yeah in their daily um, jobs to kind of uh, work on 
uh, yeah, very, it's almost a plethora of different um, sources that are being unlocked with Transcribus. And that is kind of how, how we try to um, yeah, further maintain Transcribus and then also develop those nice tools for unlocking and then also showcasing history as we've seen with Transcribus sites. That being said, we also try to provide as much help and support as possible. We have a, a quite extensive help center, so help.transcribus.org. Um, it's mainly um, in English, but we also have some German and Italian content. We try to update as much as possible. We are still a rather small team, um, try to do what we can. Sometimes also with the help of AI, as we are also an AI company. Uh, but then uh, making sure that all information is factual and, and true is also a challenge. So we try to only go as far as we really can reliably put into our help center. And we also try to provide as much support as possible with our uh, rather small team. We are still capable of having hundreds of support tickets every single month and trying to answer every single uh, email and every single ticket that we get. Sometimes it might take a little bit longer, but still we try to help you as much as possible. Um, yeah, with our support team. Now it's time for questions. We are slightly overrunning. I'm very sorry for that. Um, as you might have seen from my colleagues and from myself as well, we're really passionate about passionate about what we're doing here, uh, building those tools, um, unlocking so many yeah very interesting sources, and yeah providing those tools for so many projects that yeah basically um, try to understand what mankind did yeah dozens or hundreds of years. Ago um, is really thrilling. Um, but now let's come to some questions. And we've tried to group them into some categories. There were quite a lot of getting started and basic guidance questions. We tried to address them with the slides already. So we've tried to go through the workflow, adding the images, uploading those images, working with the editor. There are certainly some areas we probably were not able to cover. Um, here, the first. Um, place you can consult is obviously the help center. If that does not help, you can always open a ticket and we're happy to help. Uh, yeah, and to also provide you with the guidance. We're also, um, yeah, you might know my colleague Colleen already from some videos. We're also already uh, trying to provide many um, short videos to understand those concepts in shorter video formats that you can always have a look at those videos and quickly um, understand, for example, uploading or tagging. And then, yeah, get started. We are well aware that in the software there are also some issues still. We are also actively working on those, um, yeah, tiny little bugs and trying to iron those out is obviously a challenge, but we're quite happy with the progress that we're making every day. Um, then during um, this session, I've tried to answer at least some of those questions that we had in the chat uh, regarding model training and improvement. And Sarah has, um, I think you can see that Sarah is really passionate about training models and really understands what she's doing there. Um, try to cover those things. As you've seen, we have several model types already. So baseline models, field models um, that you, and also table models that you can train. We will um, this summer also introduce a new model type, which is even more interesting, which is named entity recognition. So those tags, so labeling text information um, with a tag um, that you can at the moment only manually do will also be trainable. So you can, for instance, train a model to recognize place names or persons, which is um, really interesting for yeah, data mining purposes or doing research on yeah, several different, different topics like uh, economic history, where you want to find out how many persons were um, yeah, dealing with uh, a certain case or um, yeah, were merchants or were um, yeah, owning a certain property. Then we had some scripts and that's maybe something we did not cover that much. Um, at least at the public model sites uh, or slide, you might have seen that there are more than 190 public models already. You can search them. Um, they are a little bit of a mixed bag. There are many big models that really yield good models. I think there was one question regarding a Spanish model. We have a really big Spanish model that is there, um, the Colosso Espanol. Um, you might want to try that one out as it's quite extensive. It has a big part of printed material. 
uh, in it. So um, Wadonda and I don't recall the script type name. Um, there are quite some some script types in it, so it's rather robust. Um, there was like a movement of I can't recall, but seventy researchers or so that contributed to that model, and then obviously also used that model. So um, one we have so many plans. One other plan that we have is also to provide you with the tools to uh, connect with inference scribbles, so you can then also. Uh, collectively work on such use cases because um, there are many long tail scripts languages, meaning that there are not that many users working on a very specific script, let's say Kurt Slavonic. Um, there are probably not that many globally, but if we uh, could provide you with the tool that you can connect with all others that are working on that specific script, uh, we think that that might be a great idea. Fortunately, we learned that we cannot do everything at the same time and we'll concentrate on uh, yeah, the core of Transcribus in the next months. But there is on the horizon some tools that you can also connect with others and then uh, really a focus on, on nice projects to yeah, collaborating. And eventually there's also yeah, very nice research output that you can generate um, based on those sources that you can then collectively uh, work on, train models, and then co co collaborate on those things. So yeah, the first uh, place and go to is public models. If they are not satisfying what you need in terms of um, yeah, models and different script types, you might want to train your own model. You might also want to try out in the Facebook group to reach out and say, uh, is there anyone else working on this and that? Uh, let's join forces. That's also an option. But exactly that is something that we are hoping to to deliver soon as a functionality in Transcribo, so you can then connect and, and work on, let's just admit some more, um, work on those uh, things collaboratively. Then there were quite some questions regarding genealogy. Mm -hmm. There are so many different use cases for genealogy. The first step, as we try to show, is understanding the text. Oftentimes, you don't even uh, yeah, are able to read the text uh, with older scripts. If it's an older German script type, I can also not read them, but the public models can. Um, now with the yeah, uh, movement to a lot of yeah, large language models, interestingly, you can also then put in, because the grammar and the, basically the language back at the times is also not perfectly understandable for, for us nowadays. You can even use large, large language models then to kind of translate basically those texts into modern texts to understand the content of, of that. So one use case in first place is to get out the text with the searching functionality and the sites functionality, you can then also pair that material, um, which might be another use case. And with the named entity recognition that we are trying to introduce this summer, um, you might also want to tag, so place names, for instance, if you want to tag all place names, um, in uh, yeah, corpus and then extract that, you can yeah, maybe do some data mining to understand where your ancestors have lived or how they moved around or when they moved from A to B or yeah, there are yeah, numerous use cases. At the moment, the main thing you can do with Transcribus is yeah, getting text out, so getting data out. Getting information out is one of the next steps with, with net entity recognition and additional tools that we're currently planning to build. But what you can always do is getting it out in structured form as an XML, for instance, and then use the tool of your liking to do more, more advanced analysis. So there are um, yeah, numerous possibilities um, that you can do in terms of genealogy. Technical system requirements that uh, surprised us a little bit. Um, as it's a browser-based application from Scribus, um, you basically only need a, a computer that can run a modern browser. We still have a desktop client that was developed back during project times when Transcribus was still developed during an EU-funded project, so the read project, that's also where we have our name from. And that is a little bit more tricky. So you need to have Java in installed, so uh, above on Java 17, and then you need to, to run it uh, on your machine locally. We have, um, yeah, on purpose, um, yeah, 
pursued this move to the web. Not all functionality that is already available in desktop client is available in the web, but will be um, soon. So that's also a very, very important um, uh, yeah, undertaking that we are currently working on. So you can, or don't need to download anything. You can run it in your browser, run it on yeah, virtually, yeah, not every, but almost every um, modern software or modern uh, device um, to not needing uh, yeah, to install anything and fiddle around with Java installation and um, yeah, rather outdated uh, approaches. And eventually, as we try to cover it, at least um, partially, there are a lot of advanced usage types. I said data mining and large projects, large, large scale projects with extensive amounts of data. Um, they are currently being recognized or currently being worked on with, with Transcribos. Um, depending on the specific projects, we can then try to answer those those things uh, on an individual pay basis. That's also one of the learnings that we had in the last years. There is no uh, project that is like the other. So there are always so many different things you need to consider, different types of information you want to uh, gain, different types of data you kind of generate, different type of material, writings, and there are so many variables, basically, if you want to see it as an equation that you always um, need to see specifically what it is all about. As I said, we're happy to help. If you have any projects in mind, just yeah, write us an email uh, at the info ad address. We're always happy to help and yeah, also quickly jump into a video call and consult you with whatever you might need um, with more advanced and larger scale projects. As this is where it gets really interesting in terms of yeah, getting information out. That being said, that was a rather long monologue, but we tried to condense as much as possible in those uh, yeah, Q&A sessions. Um, I've seen that my colleagues did their best in answering the questions in the chat. If we were not able to cover anything, uh, I said, write us an email, open a ticket, then we will try to reply as quickly as possible. We are very happy that so many uh, joined. We are over running 50 minutes. I'm very sorry for that. But we tried to kind of, last time we did 90 minutes, we deliberately tried to limit it to 60 minutes um, to really show you the most important things, make it not too long. And if there are more uh, concepts that you want to learn, then we try to cover them with a set of um, dedicated videos uh, because having that long format as we have it here is also a little bit exhausting. I like to talk, maybe, maybe listening that long is not that nice. Um, but still, uh, we think we we try to cover the most important concepts. Um, yeah. Do you want to add anything, Helene or Sarah? As I'm <laughs> having that very long speech at the, here. I just want to thank you for staying here with us even longer than we schedule, and also for for your messages uh, and for sharing your experience with transcribers. There were some messages about. Um, already uh, about people who are really trained models with transcribers and they're very happy with it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, we we're also very happy. And thinking back a couple of years, uh, just to end this with a little anecdote, we were joking about having 100,000 users because um, that seemed so big because we're in a niche. Um, uh, now we have 200,000 users just past that about a month ago, um, the, the speed of new users that are joining every day is just picking up and up, which is great because we at least think that we're doing some things right. There obviously are a lot of bumps that we need to still um, yeah, get past. Um, but yeah, we're quite quite happy. And yeah, in this somehow also movement that so many are joining for this year, uh, transcribers to, to unlock history. And that's what it all is. It's all about so looking history together. Yeah. And now I really wish you a nice evening, everyone. A nice morning if you're farther to the east. Or even a, a, a good night if you kind of wake, wake up or for joining us here at the webinar.